Massachusetts, Mark from the United States. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Mark from the States, how are we doing today? I am doing fantastic. I hope you are as well. Not all of me is fantastic. If you probably have already noticed, there's this part of my beard that is not behaving. Just dun dun dun. Just well, I brushed it. I slept on it. See, I slept on it, and this is what it looks like when I woke up. So, here you go. This is what you're getting. So, I apologize for this. This is unacceptable. I do need to trim my beard because it's gotten a little crazy, as you can see. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for coming and spending the next half hour or so, however long this video is. I appreciate it. I really do. It never ceases to amaze me that all of you, um, or at least some of you, or maybe none of you, I don't know. I can't see you. So it's it's always been that weird relationship. I'm just, I'm just hoping that you're there. Um, today, um, come sit on this big fake couch. Yes. Um, history chap, doing another history chap. I love history chap, Chris Green. He is amazing person, an amazing human being. Of course, he has given us his blessing. I get his newsletter, which I encourage you to sign up for. And how do you sign up for that, Mark? Well, easy. Below me are a couple links. Uh, one to the video we're about to watch. I encourage you to go over there and watch it so you don't have to listen to me. And then you can come back and watch it with me. Um, and also a link to his channel. And on his channel, there'll be a link to where you can sign up for a newsletter. And what is the newsletter? Well, the newsletter sent to your email once a week. It breaks down the week. All this cool information of this, you know, this day in history kind of a thing and what he's doing and what videos that he's going to be doing or have done that will be coming up during the week. Um, it's very informative. It talks about uh, maybe some uh, of the things that he's working on with uh, his... Uh, uh, he's got a, a the Canadian house. Um, gosh, what... I'm trying to think what he just did there. Well, anyway, they're raising money. Go to the newsletter. <laughs> Sign up for the newsletter. He explains all of it. It is uh, pretty cool. But he does talks. He does uh, live streams to where you can ask him questions. And it's just really cool stuff. So I encourage all of you, to, if you don't already, and you enjoy his videos, which I know a lot of you do because, like most of them, this one uh, was requested. Um, get over there. Get over there and show him the love. Show him that uh, we support him and all that wonderful things. Um, before we start today's video, and well, before that, let me tell you what today's video is. We watch a lot of videos on, especially with Chris, uh, about men who receive the Victoria Cross, not you know, it, it, we get to hear about their exploits, their bravery, and uh, and we see how they earn uh, their VC. Well, today's video is stripped of their VCs. So we're going to see the men, what happened, what did they do to cause uh, the stripping <laughs> of their VC. Their VC's taken away. So this should be interesting. It's a, kind of a different video than what we normally watch, which is exciting. I, you know, of all the videos we've watched before of men earning, it's just you're in awe of their bravery and what they what they do and, and go through to get uh, the honor and awarded the VC. Now we're going to see what happens when 
and uh, they get it taken away, which is kind of going to be kind of strange in a way. Uh, before we do, something we haven't done in a while is read from our book. Now, uh, the London book, this is, uh, of course, was sent to me, and you know who you are. Uh, this book has been awesome. Um, I love reading little passages out of it. It's, really, it's an easy read. The cool thing about this book is Jack, uh, I'm going to need my glasses here, Jack Cheshire, uh, the author, he is, uh, he's got a YouTube video where he talks about a lot of the things that uh, um, we read about. Now, he hasn't, like, I haven't reached out to him or anything like that. Um, but he is uh, Living London History. That's his channel name. So I encourage you to go over there uh, and see and watch his stuff. But his book is really awesome. So you know the drill. We're going to just go ahead and pick a passage here. I'm going to uh, wait for someone to say stop. Stop. Thank you for, for participating. Okay. Uh, today's passage is called An Oddity on Bankside. Uh, let's see here, what? It's a ferryman's seat. Where? Bankside, SE19DS. Sat generally unnoticed by passing masses on Bankside is a brilliant little relic, the ferryman's seat. Before 1750, so we're talking pretty old here, there was just one bridge across the Thames in central London. The London Bridge. Did you all get that one? The business of ferrying people across and along the river in small ferries was therefore a thriving one. The south bank of the river being outside the control of the city of London, particularly in the 16th and 17th centuries, was a top destination for those seeking all sorts of leisure, or leisure. Is that how you say? I say leisure. Venues such as theaters, bear baiting pits, what's a bear baiting pit, and brothels. The ferryman's seat would have been one of probably many perches by the river for the ferryman to sit on while waiting for customers to emerge following their merriment. Nobody knows when the seat dates from, but it's thought to potentially be hundreds of years old. And there's a rendering. It's not a photo. It looks like a drawing of some sort. I'm going to hold it up there. I Hopefully you can see it. I'm going to put some light underneath. So there it is. Pretty cool. Bear baiting pit. Is it just what it says? Are they going to bait bears? <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to let me know what that is. Uh, but yeah, if you are interested in that book, go get it. It is wonderful. Uh, today's video, uh, if we're ready to go, stripped of their VCs, the link to his video and to the channel, of course, is in uh, the links below me. And this funky, wild part of the beard is down below. So go over there, support Chris and the History Chap channel. Uh, really important you do so. Uh, let's get into today's video, shall we? Uh, stripped of their VCs, and let's go. Did you know that eight men awarded Britain's highest medal for valour, the Victoria Cross, were later stripped of it? But what have they done to receive such a punishment? It's time to explore a little told and shocking chapter in British military history. Before we continue, uh, live stream on Sunday. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be doing a video tomorrow. I may, but um, there is a live stream tomorrow, or uh, excuse me, Sunday. I know there's a time change with all of you. Um, 
it's so am I, I I don't know does that bring it forward or backwards I can't remember um, so it's either seven hours it's I'm gonna do it at nine o'clock my time so that's either uh, what would that be four four o'clock your time uh, or uh, is it the other way uh, six o'clock your time <laughs> uh, normally you're eight eight hours so I can't I couldn't remember if it was seven or I think it's I think we're now seven hours anyway let me know that time is very flexible um, I have uh, an event I'm going to on Saturday it's essentially a pub crawl uh, where you a Halloween pub crawl where you're gonna dress up and stuff um, that's Saturday evening <clears throat> so you know I should be good to go Sunday morning, but uh, just to let you know, um, if, if the time doesn't work for a lot of you, it, it's flexible. So anyway, let me know. It was the morning of Saturday, the 23rd of April, 1921. Hundreds of people gathered to watch the funeral cortege make its way to Witten Cemetery in Birmingham, England. The simple coffin on a gun carriage was draped to the Union flag. And as the coffin was lowered into the grave, Three volleys were fired, and the last post sounded. It was a fitting send-off for a man awarded Britain's highest military medal for valour, the Victoria Cross. George Ravenhill was awarded the VC during the Boer War, when, George under intense Ravenhill. fire, he'd helped save the guns at the Battle of Colenso. And yet, this VC hero has a darker and sadder story. Since its inception in 1856, there have been 1,358 Victoria Crosses awarded. But eight of those heroes were forced to forfeit their medals. And George Ravenhill was the last of those men. But why did he and the others have to forfeit Britain's highest medal for valour? This is his and their stories. The Victoria Cross was inaugurated by Queen Victoria in 1856, just after the Crimean War ended. Unlike its predecessors, it was open to all ranks and was specifically for acts of supreme bravery. The original idea was to make it an order of chivalry, but then the plans were changed for it to become a medal instead. And that simple change would have huge ramifications for George Ravenhill and seven other soldiers. Because the warrant or rules of the VC were based upon an order of chivalry, and specifically Clause 15. This stated that if a member of the order be convicted or indeed accused of treason, cowardice, felony, or any infamous crime, they would have brought the Victoria Cross into disrepute. Mm -hmm. and consequently, their name should be erased from the register of holders, and their pension, which was originally £10 a year or £50 a year for someone who was not quite able to earn a living due to disability or age, should cease. And, and that, I imagine, is a huge... <laughs> probably more so than the actual metal um, is the pension, right? Um, that's going to affect them while they're alive more. <laughs> One who was not quite able to earn a living due to disability or age should cease. And despite uh. the Victoria Cross becoming a medal rather than an order of chivalry, the warrant wasn't changed to reflect it. So what heinous crimes did the eight men who forfeited their Victoria Crosses commit? Let's find out. The first 85 VC recipients were announced in the London Gazette in February 1857 for retrospective actions during the recent Crimean War. One of those first 85 was Edward St. John Daniel. As a 17-year-old midshipman in the Royal Navy, he had served at the Siege of Sebastopol. His citation in the London Gazette highlighted three actions that led to his award. The first was carrying supplies of gunpowder to a gun battery whilst under fire, after that fire had killed the horses pulling the wagons. Later on, when the British tried to storm the Redan fortifications, he went to the aid of his injured captain, William Peel, son of the former British Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel. Mm. Applying a tourniquet to Peel's injured arm, he then led his officer to safety. Daniel, however, was not at the first award ceremony when Queen Victoria presented 65 medals 
at London's Hyde Park in June 1857. By then, he was sailing with Captain Peel on board HMS Shannon, bound for China. However, they were diverted to India, where it was all hands to the pumps with the outbreak of the 1857 Indian Revolt, also called the Indian Mutiny. It was here in 1858 that Peel died from smallpox, and the death of his captain seemed to impact the behaviour of the young junior officer. In 1860, and now a lieutenant, Daniel was court-martialed for drunkenness. A year later, he was listed as a deserter in advance of another court-martial for what was described as a disgraceful offence. In a very Victorian manner, no one explained exactly what that offence was, so your guess is as good as mine. However, in September 1861, Queen Victoria signed the Royal Warrant that made Edward St. John Daniel the first man to forfeit wow. his Victoria Cross. So did I understand that he never even, like, I mean, he was awarded it, but when they, he was gone already. Um, so he never actually, yes, he was awarded it, but correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how I understood that. So he never like officially was present to receive it. So weird. Leaving the Royal Navy, he died in New Zealand in 1868, aged just 31. He remains the only officer forced to forfeit his VC. Next to forfeit was a so, sergeant. Now I'm confused. I really am. So he's still able to have it on his... Is that a real headstone? Is he... Oh, man. Okay. Forced to forfeit his VC. I'll have to go back. Next to forfeit was a sergeant. James Maguire was a sergeant in the first Bengal European Fusiliers, and during the Indian Mutiny was present at the storming of Delhi in 1857. Suddenly, several ammunition boxes close by caught fire. The 30-year-old lifted them up and threw them into a ditch, preventing a major explosion. Awarded the Victoria Cross, he left the army in 1859 and returned to his native island, where he died in 1862. Shortly before his death, he was convicted of stealing a cow and was forced to forfeit uh. his Victoria Cross. Oh. Another Indian Mutiny veteran and VC holder was Valentine Bambrick. Bambrick came from a military family. Both his father and his brother served with the 11th Hussars. In fact, his brother rode with the 11th Hussars at the charge of the Light Brigade. Valentine, however, decided to join the infantry, enlisting when he was just 16 with the 60th Rifles. Awarded the Victoria beards. Cross during the revolt in India Ooh. in 1858, when he was just 21, his citation is very brief and doesn't really shed too much light on exactly what happened, apart from the fact that he defended himself against three armed Indian soldiers, killing one and wounding the others. Within a year of his award, he was in military jail three times for insubordination. Stationed back in England at Aldershot, he was once more in front of a judge, this time for assaulting and robbing another soldier of his medals. Oh, okay. Sentenced to three years hard labour, his VC was declared forfeit. Yeah, that one I can totally understand. The, the insubordination stuff I could probably let slide. Um, because it doesn't, no matter what they do, it didn't take away what their actions were to receive the actual cross. Um, but I get why they have to do that. Um, Stealing a cow, I don't know. Obviously, back in those days, that's probably hardcore, you know, no, no. But, uh, wow. Bambrick committed Can't suicide steal other medals, while serving his sentence at Penton Prison in 1864. It was nearly a decade before there was another forfeiture. Michael Murphy was born in County Tipperary, Ireland. He joined what was called the Military Train, later the Army Service Corps and now the Royal Logistics Corps. Rather like Midshipman Daniel, he too was en route for the Far East when his ship was diverted to India in 1857. He was Running awarded theme. Britain's highest medal for valour when, despite being severely wounded himself, he defended an injured comrade during the mutiny. He was presented with his BC by Queen Victoria herself at Windsor Castle 
and nice. rose to the rank of Farrier Major before transferring to the 7th Hussars in 1871. So far, so a year good. Later, 1872, he and a civilian accomplice were arrested for stealing sacks of horse fodder from the depot. Sentenced to nine months hard labour, an order was issued for the forfeit of his Victoria Cross. However, his wife and children had suddenly disappeared from their military accommodation, along with his VC. Despite that blemish on his record, Murphy actually remained in the army for another three years before leaving after 20 years service in 1875. Okay, well, um, stealing, not great, obviously, um, but it didn't bother you enough to, I don't mean all of you, <laughs> I meant the people in charge at the time, to keep them in the army, um, to allow them to stay in the army. Different times, I know that, different times. But just, you just, it's like I'm expecting to hear, and I'm sure maybe it does get progressively worse. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, but yeah, different times. Can't steal. The guy stealing the other dude's medals, yeah, that's, that's a no-no. But so far, you know, stealing cows and, and horse, whatever, you know, come on. But I get it. I get it. Rules are rules. Got to have, you know, you got to act a certain way. I mean, it's such a prestigious honor, right? So I get that. He moved to Northumberland in the northeast of England, becoming a blacksmith before working in an ironworks and dying of pneumonia in 1893. Hmm. Five years later, his Victoria Cross resurfaced at an auction, being sold by an anonymous seller. It was actually purchased on behalf of the Army Service Corps and is now housed at the Royal Logistics Corps Museum in Winchester. Well, that's cool. That's awesome. Um, so they don't take back the medal? They just... Uh, I'm, I'm sure... Do, do they actually physically take the medal back? Um, how did this one get out there to be sold um, down the road? I'm glad it did because it ended up in a great place, but um, that one kind of confused me as well. It's early in the morning too, so my brain probably hasn't started functioning properly. And I've got this thing going, so. Next to forfeit their Victoria Cross was Thomas Lane. He was awarded the VC during the storming of the Taku Forts in the Second Opium War in China, while serving with the 67th Regiment of Foot, later the Hampshire Regiment. He went on to serve in South Africa, where in 1881, he was convicted of desertion and a theft of a horse and arms. The War Office requested that the authorities in South Africa return his Victoria Cross to London. However, okay. they were unable to... So they do take the medal back, okay. That answers that question. Uh, or they at least request, they request for it to come back. Again, someone's stealing a horse. Um, the guy just took off, obviously. Took some guns and stole a horse and took off. Deserted. That's, that, I understand that. You can't do that. You can't desert. You can't. To do so, as he had entrusted it to a friend and he wouldn't divulge their name. Mm. Thomas Lane died in South Africa eight years later. Shortly before the First World War, his Victoria Cross also surfaced, this time in a pawnbroker's back in Britain. No way. It's now in possession of the Hampshire Regiment Museum, which is also based in Winchester. <laughs> awesome. Malden in Essex is probably best known for its sea salt. On Spittle Road in the town sits St. Peter's Hospital, with its imposing Victorian frontage. But when nice. it was built in the 1830s, it had a darker purpose. It was the Malden Union Workhouse, capable of housing up to 450 inmates. And it was in this workhouse that another man who forfeited his VC died in 1912. Frederick Corbett, originally from London, earned the Victoria Cross during General Sir Garnet Wolseley's expedition against Durabi Pasha in Egypt in 1882. During a skirmish south of Alexandria, an officer was mortally wounded 
And despite the officer being out in the open, Corbett ran over and stayed with the man whilst under fire, trying to stem the bleeding. He was recommended for the BC, which he received the following year. Shortly afterwards, he left the army, only to re-enlist with the Royal Artillery in 1884. Before the year was out, he was convicted at a court-martial of being absent without leave and embezzlement and theft from an officer. His Victoria Cross was forfeited by royal warrant and his VC pension terminated. Yikes, but that's more, the part. Like some of the other men I've talked about, his VC wasn't returned to the army or the government. Although, in his case, it wasn't because of a calculated evasion, but something slightly sadder. During his very brief spell in Civvy Street, he had fallen into financial hardship. He and sold it. His Victoria Cross. Oh, man. Despite the adverse court-martial of being absent without leave, embezzlement and theft from an officer, he actually remained in the army until 1891. But upon returning to civilian life, he once more struggled with money. He ended his days in the Malden workhouse, where he died in 1912. Yikes. Corbett That's... was buried in an unmarked grave. Oh, man. It wasn't until 2004 Oh, the headstone cool. was finally placed on his grave in the town. So they still can put VC on the tombstone, obviously, the headstone, which I think is, I'm okay with. I would be, uh, I mean, what he did after doesn't change the fact of what he did to earn that medal. Now, yeah, maybe you don't have the physical medal, <laughs> Um, in his case, he sold it because he needed the money, which you hate to hear. Um, but uh, it happens, obviously. Uh, but I still, I appreciate that they still recognize his actions that got him the medal. I'm sure the pension thing really is, you know the kicker that really makes it tough on a lot of these guys. James Collis was born in 1856, the year that the VC was inaugurated. In 1880, he was serving with the Royal Horse Artillery during the Second Anglo-Afghan War. During the British defeat at the Battle of Maywand, an officer was trying to load wounded men onto the limber to escape the battlefield. Collis ran forward, drawing Afghan fire away from the limber enabling the officer to move the injured men to safety. Nice. For this action, he was awarded the Victoria Cross. Sure. 15 years later, in 1895, he was convicted of bigamy. Sentenced to 18 months hard labor, he was also ordered to forfeit his VC. Bigamy. Having served his prison sentence, he settled in the Suffolk market town of Bury St. Edmunds. Incredibly, when the First World War broke out, James Collis, now aged 58, re-enlisted with the Suffolk Regiment. He served as a drill sergeant until discharged on medical grounds in 1917. Wow. He died in 1918 from a heart attack and was buried with military honours at Wandsworth in London. Bear with me here. Bigamy. Really? Now, it's not, that's a new one. <laughs> okay, so if I, I, I'm feeling pretty stupid here. Uh, I'm trying to think, is bigamy, it's not polygamy. Polygamy is having more than one wife. Bigamy, technically, if I remember, is also, it, well, you're, you're married already and you marry someone else while still being married. So you got married twice, which is, Technically, like polygamy, right? I mean, you already have a wife. Uh, but bigamy is marrying while still being married. Uh, I hope that's right. Um, but that's an odd one. Most of I was just I was ready for them to tell us how they stole something or something, stole a horse or a cow, but he uh, or a wall or desertion. But bigamy, that's a new one. Yeah, that's bad. That's not good. Following his death, his sister wrote to King George V, pleading for her brother's name to be restored to the Victoria Cross Register. Whilst not initially reinstating his name on the register, 
The King's private secretary did agree on behalf of the King that his name should appear on the list of VC recipients on the Royal Artillery Memorial. The final man to forfeit his Victoria Cross was the man that this story started yeah. with, George Ravenhill from Birmingham. George Albert Ravenhill was born on the 23rd of February 1872 in the Thimble Mill Lane in the Neutrals area of the city, son of Mary and Thomas Ravenhill, a wood turner. He enlisted with the Royal Scots Fusiliers in May 1898, and a year later found himself in South Africa fighting in the Anglo-Boer War. It was during the disastrous Battle of Colenso, the third British defeat in what the press dubbed Black Week, that Ravenhill was recommended for the Victoria Cross. During the battle, the British guns had advanced way ahead of the infantry and had come under Boer fire without any support. Some way behind them, George Ravenhill and his comrades in the Royal Scots Fusiliers were desperately trying to keep up. Whilst the Naval Brigade managed to withdraw their six guns, the 12 guns of the artillery lay abandoned with most of their crews killed. Mm. Three officers, Captain Schofield, Congrave, and Lieutenant Roberts, son of Field Marshal Lord Roberts of Kandahar, rode forward to rescue the guns. Ravenhill ran under heavy fire from his shelter position to assist them. They managed to get two of the guns to safety before Roberts was killed, and the other two officers, along with Private Ravenhill, were wounded. For his actions, Ravenhill was awarded the Victoria Cross, which was presented to him by Queen Victoria's grandson, the Duke of York. Nice. George Ravenhill left the army in early 1908. By then, he was married to Florence Langford and had four children. He found it difficult to adjust to civilian life and, like many other veterans from this period, fell mm -hmm. on hard times. Within just a matter of months, he and his family ended up in the Aston Union Workhouse in Birmingham. Now, if you're shocked to hear that yet another Victoria Cross holder ended up in a workhouse, you're not alone. Even at the time, people were shocked too. In May 1908, Cecil Harmsworth, the MP for Droitwich, raised his plight in the House of Commons. The MP asked the Secretary of State for war. What action was being taken to help this war hero? The Secretary of State responded that the case was under investigation. Well, it seems that the investigation either hadn't proceeded with much speed or come to the right conclusion, when in August of that year, Ravenhill appeared at Aston Police Court. The court record described him as a labourer of no fixed residence. And along with two others, he was accused of stealing iron to the value of six shillings from the Bromford Mill in Birmingham. It was also noted that he'd already been in front of the court a few months beforehand for refusing to perform his allotted tasks in the workhouse. Ravenhill said he was struggling financially as he hadn't received a pension of 50 pounds, which he claimed he was owed. Nevertheless, he was found guilty of the theft and fined 10 shillings, nearly twice the value of the stolen goods. However, when Ravenhill said that he couldn't pay the fine, he was sent to jail for a month instead. Yep. He was the last man to forfeit his Victoria Cross, which was sold by the War Office at Sotheby's later that year for £42. Following his stint in prison, Ravenhill continued... Wait a minute. He was sent to jail for a month instead. He was the last man to forfeit his Victoria Cross, which was sold by the War Office at Sotheby's later Seriously? that year for £42. Following his stint in prison, Ravenhill continued to struggle financially. Yeah. In the 1911 census, he and his family were again registered as inmates in the workhouse. Two years later, George and Florence took what must have been a heart-wrenching decision to send three of their children to North America to be fostered. Oh. Sometime after that, they moved to the Cotswold market town of Chipping Norton and had two more children. On the 11th of September, 1914, the best three weeks after the First World War broke out, he re-enlisted in the army. Isn't it strange? You aren't worthy of wearing your Victoria Cross, but you are still worthy to be killed fighting for your country. Bingo. Yes. I'm right there with you, Chris. And they were ruthless. The people in charge of you, you get to keep yours, you don't get to keep yours, we're not going to pay you, this, that, and the other. <clears throat> Brutal. But yeah, you could certainly fight for us and certainly die for us. But dang, ruthless. I mean, you look at the offenses that we've seen so far. Um, uh oh, I'll save my diatribe until the very end here.
Initially, he served in the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry before transferring to the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, where his campaign medal record shows him serving on the Salonica Front in November of 1915. He was discharged from the army on medical grounds in 1916. Once more, he and his family returned to Aston in Birmingham, where the last of his eight children, a daughter, was born in 1919. George Ravenhill died of a heart attack aged 49 in Dang. April 1921. He left his widow and children living in a one-bedroomed tenement apartment. <sighs> Despite the full military honours at his funeral at Witten Cemetery in Birmingham on the 23rd of April 1921, he was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave. His name Lame. is engraved on the screen wall at the cemetery, and he lies in a grave simply numbered 36. That's a it shame. was a sad and even shocking end to a man awarded Britain's highest medal for valour. The idea that a man deemed brave enough to receive the VC should then have it taken away certainly angered the man who, as Duke of York, had presented Ravenhill with his medal in 1901. He was now King George V. Uh -huh. In the wake of James Collis's sister writing to him the year before Ravenhill's death, the King expressed his sentiments very strongly to his private secretary in July 1920. No matter the crime committed by anyone on whom the VC has been conferred, the decoration should not be forfeited. Atta the boy. King went on, were a VC to be sentenced to be hanged for murder, he should be allowed to wear the VC on the scaffold. Powerful words, and I suspect uh. you agree with me. Absolutely right. Yeah. Since then, no one has ever had to forfeit their Victoria Cross. George Ravenhill and the other seven men were readmitted to the register of Victoria Cross holders. And while some VC recipients since then awesome. have indeed fallen on hard times or been accused of crimes, they have never been stripped of the medal that they earned for valour in the service of their country. If the stories of the men awarded... Thank you, Chris. Um, go support him uh, and his channel. Uh, this was a great video. This was awesome. And I'm so happy it is now all my... I should have just waited to the end, right? Um, we're all answered. I was going through a lot. I was like, why are these actions that they uh, that done in battle uh, not able to stay with them? Um, and thank you, King George, for, you know, righting a wrong, I believe. Um, because some of those, imagine if it wasn't changed as we, I mean, I mean, some were such minor deals, at least I, in my eyes, but like I said, different times, but a lot of these guys didn't have money. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot still, <clears throat> excuse me, sold their VCs down the road. I'm sure there's probably cases of that still. But the fact that answers the question why they still have VC on their headstone. Um, I love it. This was great. Um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was starting to get fired up. <laughs> but I'm glad King George came in there to right the wrong. Um, you allow them to fight and die on a battlefield for you, but you can't, you know, take away the cross like that. That's just crazy, but awesome. That was an... That was, <clears throat> that was awesome. Um, thank you to Chris. Please, everyone, links below me here. Get over to his channel. Or is it that way? I can't remember. It's one of these ways. I think it might be over that way. Uh, get over to his channel. Support him. Like, subscribe. If you have one like and one subscribe today, I encourage you to go over to his channel to, to apply it over there. Um, of course... I am so grateful that all of you have come to watch and learn with me today. And uh, I may be with you tomorrow. Um, we'll see. Um, but until then, hope everybody's happy, healthy, and safe. And uh, hope you have a wonderful day. And we'll see you later. All right. Bye-bye. Mark from the States. Mark from the States. It's Mark. And he's from